Bless God. Praise and glory be to Jesus. Let's really turn our eyes to the Lord. As we turn our eyes to him and we gaze at his face, then of course the things of the world uh, will go strangely dim. Hallelujah. In his light, he is that marvelous light. In his light, we see things strangely dim. Praise the Lord. Things that can bother us, things that can trouble us. Praise and glory be to Jesus. This is uh, our normal Bible study in the book of Ephesians. And uh, as you know, God's people, the book of Ephesians is very rich. It is a kind of heavenly book where every book is inspired and every book is good for our learning, our uh, admonition. But this book is very different. The Lord has revealed to his servant who chose to become the prisoner of Jesus. He revealed to him things that are hidden uh, in other books. They are not revealed to the men and women in the world. So, Father, we thank you for this uh, great privilege of uh, coming to this book. And we come with this acknowledgement that we cannot understand your mysteries. But we thank you for the Holy Spirit. And uh, we thank you, Father that you have sent the Holy Spirit who reveals to us the things no one else can do. Thank you for the great revelation that he will bring to us this evening. Tune to your voice, O oh Lord. Holy Spirit, we pray that you will speak to us clearly from chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your faithfulness. In faithfulness, Spirit of the living God, you have always imparted to us something wonderful, something precious. So we pray this evening that you will impart to us the revelation that we need. Lord, we are not looking for information. We are looking for revelation uh, that will become the foundation of our transformation. We don't want to stay the same because the time is short. And Lord, we haven't got time anymore to play games or to just to take things easy. It is a, a time, Lord, in which you have revealed to us already that Antichrist will appear someday, soon, we do not know when. But we are look, looking forward to your revelation, not his revelation because when he will appear on the scene, you will give him three and a half years and you will always be in control. You will begin to destroy his kingdom and you will even in his kingdom choose people for your eternal kingdom. We are so glad that you're on the throne. We are so glad and we rejoice that you keep looking upon us. Your gaze is upon us, and uh, we are so excited to know this, that you have carved our figure individually on the palm of your hand, and our refuge and our protection is always before us. We thank you that you kept us. We thank you. So, Spirit of the Living God, we hand this study over to you. Have your way with us. Speak to us the ways of our God. And particularly, we want to know the way clearer and clearer every moment of the day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, praise God. And we turn to Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, it speaks about a reality many people do not know. To know this reality, one has to uh, have this knowledge, or one has to be equipped with, the, with this knowledge that we are spirit, soul, and body. 
as we read also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. Let's start with this. If someone does not know the distinction between spirit, soul, and body, then of course they may not have a clear understanding of chapter 2. Verse 1 demands clear understanding of the distinction between spirit, soul, and body. And this is what the scripture says so clearly. There are other passages, but this passage is very clear. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, we read, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are tripart being, just as God manifests himself in Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He has made us or created us in three parts, spirit, soul, and body. We also read this revelation in another scripture, which is in Hebrew chapter 4 and verse 12. We are, we are required that we make distinction between spirit, soul, and body. Here it is put in a different manner, and it demands a full sermon, but I know you understand, and we want, just want to have this idea that we need to understand our spirit, soul, and body a little bit, before we could understand chapter 2 and verse 1. Otherwise, uh, some may have difficulty in understanding the reality. It says in chapter 4, Hebrew chapter 4 and verse 12, For the word of God is quick. And uh, there are two kinds of words. There is written word, and we have got 66 books, uh, 39 in the Old Testament. Uh, that can be a foundation. And then we see the magnificent building of the New Testament, 27 books. But the word used here is not the written word, but is the living word. The written word speaks about the living word. The written word is the testimony of the living word. And let me finish this, and then I'll explain this very, uh, very quickly, and then we will move on. For the word of God is quick and powerful. Powerful. It's not talking about the written word. Uh, here it is spoken about uh, the living word. And Christ Jesus is the living word. When did he become a living word? According to my understanding of uh, research in the scripture, uh, and comparing the scripture with scripture, it was the time when God thought about creating the universe. There was nothing. There was only Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And uh, of course, if Trinity is one spirit, if they are one, you don't need words to speak something to each other. Does it make sense? What I'm trying to say is God is one, one spirit. Now, if God is one spirit, then everything is known to everyone. Everyone knows everything, and uh, voice is not needful. It is not required. That is why uh, some people can be puzzled that how can God have beginning? You remember uh, in John chapter 1 and verse 1 is written, in the beginning. Does God have beginning? Because that passage also calls the word God. God hasn't got, a, hasn't got a beginning. So when it is written, in the beginning was the word, that means 
when God wanted to create the universe, wanted to create, uh, create the angels and other beings, other uh, heavenly being, he needed a voice. He needed a word. He made everything with the word. It's written very clearly in the beginning, chapter 1, John chapter 1, starting from verse 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus has always been God, but for the sake of creation, God declared Jesus the word. His name is also mentioned in chapter 19. It's written his name is the word. So the word was needed if there will be any, any creation, if God would create something. Before, before anything was created, there was the spirit. God is spirit. And he manifests himself in three. Because there was only one spirit, there was no need for a voice or a word for communication. Communication was just going on, just by looking. And the one spirit uh, doesn't require uh, a lot of communication with each other because everybody understands everything. Praise the Lord. But there is a beginning of the word, and that word is Jesus Christ. And then another passage that is very uh, revealing before we move any further, uh, that is about uh, about about Christ again. And uh, all the Old Testament, or you can say the whole New Testament, that simply means from Genesis to Revelation, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have the testimony of Jesus. It's written very clearly, Jesus speaking himself, and he's speaking to the Jewish uh, congregation or in the street. Of course, they were not in a building. They were talking to him in the street. And it is written here in chapter 5, and uh, I'm going to read from verse 39. He's addressing these Jewish people, and he says to them that you are applying the word not rightly. Uh, he is actually speaking to them and saying to them that the only word, that means the knowledge or information about all the books, will do you no good. As an example, you remember that it was not doing any good to Paul or Saul. His name was Saul before. And before he had an encounter with Jesus on the way to Damascus, and he, uh, he fell from his high horse, and uh, his language was changed. And he said, who are you, Lord? That is the first question uh, he asked that I should say. First question that came out of his mouth was, who are you, Lord? And I tell you, he didn't change the question all his life. All his life, was, his aim was to find out, who are you, Lord? And you remember in Philippians chapter 3, and verse 1 to onward you read, he talks all about knowing God is superior to everything else, every experience, everything he owns. Knowing God is the greatest thing. He says to them, says the scripture, for in them ye think, and their thinking was wrong, because the scripture kills, where it is written in 2 Corinthians, uh, the latter kill, the actual word is scripture. I believe the translator was a bit puzzled, and they could not understand how the scripture can kill. I tell you, scripture does kill. It killed Jesus Christ. Scripture, who initiated the arrest of, the, of Christ, Jewish people. Of course, God has forgiven them. Jesus uh, took time to forgive them before he said anything else. He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they, uh, what they do. Search the scripture, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they 
That means the scripture, all the scripture, which testify of me. In simple words, from Genesis to Malachi, all the 39 books, they are my testimony. They talk about me. They are prophecy. Today I was talking to one of my friends and I told them the great proof of the authenticity or, or the authority of uh, the 39 books is their prophetic word. And I tell you the way the prophetic word have been fulfilled in itself is absolutely marvelous. It's so wonderful. If anyone who does not know the Lord would simply begin to uh, ponder, begin to think of the scripture that have been fulfilled in Christ, over 300 testimony or prophecy, I tell you, uh, he will simply bow before the Lord. How can that be? How can it be written about a man who is going to be born hundreds of years after that? It cannot be coincidence. Coincidence do not happen like that. So God's people is, uh, is when, we, when we read here in Hebrew, the word is the written word, and the written word speaks about the living word. And uh, those who read the scripture, through the Holy Spirit, from Genesis to Malachi. Try it and you will find it. Says the Holy Spirit, I want to find my Messiah here. I want to find Jesus here. Uh, I have heard from the lips of my master that they are my, my testimony. I want to know it. And you'll find exactly what Jesus said. In other words, you will find the Old Testament as a a magnificent gallery and wherever you look you will see the painting of the Lord Jesus Christ painted so beautifully uh, in parable in ways that are not difficult to understand. So with this word we have uh, given enough scripture to prove that we are tripart. We are spirit, soul and body. Spirit was placed in man. To make it very simple, God did not make the spirit dead or uh, that needed to, be, uh, needed to be quickened. Let's read the first verse and that will make sense. I have given all these passages and I've spoken about man being spirit, soul, and body because I didn't want any misunderstanding in the first word, verse that is very powerful, and it can become a gospel message. Yes, it can be beneficial for us, but it can become a gospel message, and it's our prayer that anyone who will hear will comprehend and will be born again, child of God, and be prepared for the kingdom of heaven. And you hath he quickened. You simply mean uh, the people of God. Uh, you simply mean saints. Uh, it's not written only to the vision. It is to every born again child of God. And you hath he quickened. Uh, well, that is very clear that we were not quickened. If we were not quickened, we were dead. Did God make uh, Adam uh, with a dead spirit, did he place in him dead spirit that needed awakening, needed quickening? Uh, for that, we have to go back. And uh, we have to learn this fact. God doesn't make dead things. God is a wonderful creator. And uh, when he created Adam in his own image, and when he placed the spirit, human spirit, I mean, in, the, uh, in, in Adam, it was a spirit that was living. It was not a dead spirit. And uh, as you, we have studied the scripture, and the first chapter speaks very clearly that God made man in his own image. Verse 28 speaks about his authority, about the power, about the uh, 
about the mammoth work that God gave it to man. That work was to control the whole universe, to have dominion over everything. I mean, everything that moves, the Lord said, you have dominion over it. But what happened then? At that time, God's purpose was very simple. I'm just repeating some of the things. God's people, you know, maybe you know them all. The purpose of God was that he will live in, in the spirit of man. In other words, spirit was placed, soul was created when? When God breathed into the nostril of man, the breath of life, the place where the breath touched the clay body, at that place, there was another entity born, I, I should say created, and that was soul. And so man became a living soul. You say, well, uh, don't you think that, uh, don't, don't you say uh, that God created man and his spirit to, uh, and placed his spirit? Of course, man was created. Of course, his body was created. So, but spirit was not created. Can you see that? Spirit came from the Lord. Spirit was placed there. Well, uh, if you have got some question, then you can ask question later, but the spirit was given. Soul was created, body was formed from the dust. And if man would not fall, you see fall necessitated Christ to come in this world. Because if they will not sin, they will be innocent. Of course, there were, there were others that did not sin. When God created them, they were innocent. But their spirit was not dwelling place of God. As I told you uh, before, that the spirit was given to be the dwelling place of God. God wanted spirit, a place where he would dwell, where God and man will become one, where it will be a matter of uh, relational, relationality, it, they will be related to each other. And uh, for that, what man needed to do was to lay down his soulish life. Is it not written in chapter 2 and verse 7 of Genesis uh, that man became a living soul, not living spirit? Was God talking to him? Yes. Was God in relationship with man? Yes. What kind of relationship were they? They were outward. Inward relationship had not yet begun. For the inward relationship to begin, let's see very clearly so that there will be no misunderstanding. Man had to lay down his soulish life. His life was lived by soul. Soul had the mind, soul had emotion. Soul is also called Carnal, uh, carnal personality. So, uh, so, so God could speak to man, uh, but he was still in his soul, living through his soul, what he needed to do, what, what was required for the relationship to begin. For the relationship to begin, man has to take a deliberate decision and he should intentionally not randomly, intentionally lay down his soul and go and intentionally eat the tree of life. That was the, that was the representation of, God was looking for representation. Man was to be a representation, but to be a representation, he has to be one with God, one with Christ. So before he could take this decision, what decision? To laying down his life and then seeking the life of God. Are you with me? 
laying down his life and seeking the life of God. Where was the life of God? The tree of life. The tree of life, if you have to eat it, you will have. It's the same way Jesus said, Jesus speaks uh, in chapter 6 of John that was misunderstood. If they would hear clearly, there will be no misunderstanding. Because Jesus spoke to them and he said to them, my words are spirit and they are life. But they were taking it literally. They were offended, so they left it. Man had to do simply one thing. Lord, I lay down my life in the soul. I am willing to take your life in. Now from this time on, I am willing to begin to live your divine life. God, God's plan is not changed. In man, the same thing happened when Christ came. So what happened was the tragedy struck. Man was received. Woman was deceived. And that fallen thing then, you know, in which man fell. Man fell from the grace. Man had alliance with the devil. He rejected God and accepted devil. He became his slave. Whom you, whom you obey, you become their slave. So he became from then on slave of Satan. That was the point. That's what I'm believing. I'm very clear. I think there is nothing, uh, nothing uh, that is not clear here. Spirit of man was dead. Dead to God. Alive to Satan. There was killing. There was mass conversion to devil. It happened at the time of Noah. And again, that is happening now. Man began to rebel against God. Tower of Babel is one of the examples. They did, just didn't want to build a tall building. They wanted to reach God by their own effort. And I believe religion is doing the same thing. And uh, I tell you, it's not going to be long when the religion will be introduced. Man's religion, man's idea, man's thinking, always go to God. Well, that is unbiblical. That is false. But that false teaching will be very much in, in before us. And uh, maybe we will not be able to preach so clearly as we are preaching today. So when you have got time, Let's preach it and let's tell people about it before the door closes. So God's people, this is what happened. The man's spirit was dead to God. And here in Ephesians, I think I have tried to explain it clearly and I've taken time to do it. It was needed. Uh, so Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, and you hath he quickened. But how this work of quickening happened? Did God just decide to quicken the spirit of man? No. It was a great price. Because when man sinned and his spirit was dead to God, God had to bring forth eternal sacrifice. The love of God was in motion. God so loved the world as we see that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever, it's whoever. You have got nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with anything that you differ from another. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So chapter 3, verse 15, there was a promise of the Redeemer. Promise of the one who will be born of women, woman, uh, and uh, it will it will be virgin birth. It will not be born with the seed of man, because with the, the dead spirit, man's seed was now corrupt. Man's thoughts were corrupt. In chapter six, we see so clearly he could only think evil. He was becoming evil. Every day more and more. Same thing happening again. As it was in the beginning, so will it be 
in the end. Don't you know that Jesus Christ himself is the beginning and the ending? He is the one who is the initiator. He initiates things and he brings them into conclusion. Now, in our age, we might see the conclusion or we may leave before the conclusion. We do not know exactly when we will leave or when Christ will come. But it's not going to be before all the tribulation we go through. It's not going to be pre-tribulation. I beg to say to those who differ from me, I believe in, uh, in this, that God will choose us to go through tribulation and he will strengthen us and we will be refined. Sometime fire is needed. Well, let's come back. You know, I may, I've got no notes here so I can drift anywhere, uh, but I will try to control myself. And you had he quickened. So he had quickened. And the quickening work was not an easy work. Jesus had to pay the price for that. He has to pay the price uh, as a ransom. He has to taste the death for everyone. It is written in, I think, chapter 2 of Hebrew and verse 9. He tasted death for everyone. He became propitiation for everyone. He does not impute sin to anyone. How? Oh, because he has paid the penalty. But the very strong indication is one has to come to him. One has to acknowledge that he did it. One has to acknowledge, and I believe the Lord can give faith to people. He draws them in. So, quickening did not come cheap. It was not something. He quickened us and it was very, no, no, no. It cost Jesus his life. And God's people, there can be another wonderful thought here. That it shows the value of human beings. He put such a value on human being that father was willing to give his son and to die such a brutal death so that the work that was required to quicken the spirit might be fulfilled in Christ. And I tell you, and you have read it, it was fulfilled to the complete completion. Uh, God's people, it was perfectly perfect. When Jesus said it is finished, this, the word in Greek is perfectly per perfect and completely complete. So this is a very simple now. The verse is not no very simple. We were born to our human parents in sin. We were born with human nature. Uh, we, I should say we were born in sin nature. And that's why everyone sin naturally. People lie wholesale. People defraud wholesale. They're not even ashamed that they are stealing. They're not even ashamed that they are defrauding. And uh, they stand before people, even though they have stolen everything, they do not blush. They do not ashamed themselves that all we have done is based on a lie. But people cover it. They don't worry about it. That is the last time. That tells me a lot, you know, because the uh, because what happened in America tells me a lot that lie uh, can win, defrauding can win, and people can lie and still achieve their goal. Well, that was a frightening fact to me, but particularly, and it will be frightening to you too. And uh, so, quickening work was done by Lord Jesus Christ. He went to the cross and he paid the penalty in full. He even paid for our sicknesses. At that whipping post, it is written very clearly that one less 40 lashes came on his back and it was torn apart. That was the price he paid. He paid the price to, in this context. He paid the price so our spirit could be quickened. So what happens? When one believes in the sacrifice of Jesus, 
When one believes that Jesus died for me, when one believes that he died as me, he took my sin upon himself so that I'll be dead to sin alive, alive to God. Uh, God's people, that's what it means in verse 1. Let's move on, please, because our time is gone and we are still in verse 1. And you hath he quickened. Praise God for the work of Jesus that quickens us. Without that work on the cross, there will be no quickening. And praise God that God accepted the work of Jesus and we are justified by his rising from, from the dead. And we are justified before God. What does justification mean? What does justify mean? Just as I had never sinned. That's a wonderful good news, but it has been paid in full. It is not that God in his love has told everybody to come in. Don't worry. No, he has paid our sin with the life of his son who laid his life, suke life, of course, because he could not lay Zoe life. Zoe life was with him. God cannot die for Zoe life, that godly life. So let's move on, please. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Praise God for this quickening. I tell you, God's people, we need to give thanks for this wonderful, wonderful thing that the Lord has done. God has accomplished. Good deeds have no power to accomplish it. Good deeds could not do it. Only the blood of Jesus can cleanse us from sin. And when Jesus was on this earth, and you remember the words of John the Baptist, he said very clearly, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And then because he has taken away the sin of the world, because he has bought people out of human beings, that's why he could open the seal. He is the Lord of glory, and he is revealed in the book of Revelation. Uh, verse 1, chapter 2, Ephesians, let's read it. And, uh, and you hath he, Jesus Christ, who were dead in trespasses and sin. You, we were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world. So God's people, we need to be merciful to the people who yet do not know the Lord, whose spirit have yet not been quickened, because by faith, as they believe in Jesus, their spirit will be quickened. Uh, to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that means devil, who has blinded the eyes of the people, religious or irreligious, it doesn't matter. Heathen, you believe in God or you don't believe in God, if your spirit is not quickened, the spirit of Christ cannot come in you. The word that is a living word cannot come in your spirit. As it is written in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. He's talking about the people who yet have not been privileged people to get to know the Lord. How we need to pray for them how we need to go to them, how we need to love them so that they could see the love of God. They are called in the scripture, children of disobedience. Are we better than them? No. We have received mercy. We have received grace. He has drawn us unto himself. So we can just praise him for his grace, praise him for his mercy. Verse 3. Among whom also we all had our conversation. We're talking about our past. Our past was no good. It's not worth talking about. It's not worth wasting your time. Our past is gone, over, finished with. It is no more to be remembered because on the cross, the past was completely been paid for. We don't need to be condemned 
by our rotten past. We don't need to remember our rotten past because if God doesn't remember, we should not remember too. Among whom also ye all had our conversation. We all had our conversation in time past in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. Well, that word is bit, bit tough. Children of wrath. And this is exactly what Jesus says about the people who do not know the Lord. Uh, is chapter 3, and if you read verse 18 and verse 36, Jesus spoke about this, and he used these words. Chapter 3, and I'm going to read verse Verse 36, that's why we need to pray for our unbelieving friends. That is why we need to pray for the unbelieving world. That is why we need to pray for their conversion. That is why the Lord told very clearly that pray to the Lord of the harvest, that he will send laborer into his field. He cares for those people. He cares that they will, should be saved. If we love him. We will go out of our way to pray for them. We will seek God's will for them so that they can be converted to the Lord. Verse 36, I'm reading, and these are powerful words. Uh, they are the words that every one who doesn't know the Lord give heed to. He that believeth on the Son, he that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. It is not. He will have, when he receives him, he comes in his heart and he begins to clean him up. And it's not going to be his effort now, but he will begin to fight with everything that is not good in the sight of God. And that he believeth not, the son shall not see life. It says here, read, let me read it again. He that believes not, on the Son, he that believes on the Son, I should say, please, he that believes on the Son has everlasting life, and he that believes not the Son shall not see life. That's a Zoe life. That's a divine life. That is eternal life. That is the life we will spend with him for all eternity. He will, and he that believes not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Wrath of God abides on everyone who does not know Jesus as Savior and Lord. And God's people, what a great need. What a great need for us to pray for these people. Time is short. We need to be prepared. We need to be praying for the laborer and I'm sure I'm sure when we pray for the laborer definitely we will be one of the laborer let's pray that many will hear and the fear of God will come in their heart and they will believe and be saved they will be believe they will believe and receive him in their heart and he will begin to Clean them up from within. That's where his kingdom is. The kingdom of God is within you. And time comes when he, he can show himself to the world through you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for opening up our eyes. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Lord, we thank you that we were enabled by your drawing, uh, by your love, that we would turn our eyes to Jesus and our spirit will be quickened. And we will say yes to you. And you will come and establish your kingdom in our hearts. Lord, we pray that many who has heard this word will turn to you and 
believe in you and receive you as their Lord and their Savior. And Lord, be saved for all eternity because their spirit will be quickened and Christ will begin to fill them with himself. We are so glad for this wonderful, clear truth that you have put very clearly for us in your word. So Lord, bless everybody who hears to the glory of God in Jesus' name. Amen.